<laughs> All right, here we go. Section 43. We got trouble. We got trouble in section 43. What kind of trouble we got? We got Hubble trouble. Uh, that's, let's open up section 43. We got some serious Almost. Hubble oh. trouble. Who is Hubble trouble? We're not quite sure, but here's the best we got. John Whitmer, he said this, about these days, about these days, there was a woman by the name of Hubble, possibly Laura Fuller Hubble, older sister of Edson Fuller, mentioned in the NCJ 228. So Mrs. Hubble professed to be a prophetess of the Lord and professed to have many revelations and knew the Book of Mormon was true and that she should become a teacher in the Church of Christ. She appeared very sanctimonious, deceived some who were not able to detect her in her hypocrisy. Others, however, had the spirit of discernment, and her follies and abominations were made manifest. The Lord gave revelation that the saints might not be deceived, which reads as follows. Nancy 43. Here's another one from Ezra Booth. He said, A female professing to be a prophetess made her appearance in Kirtland, and so ingratiated herself into the esteem and favor of some of the elders that they received her as a person commissioned to act a conspicuous part in Mormonizing the world. It's a cool verb, Mormonizing. But Smith declared her an imposter when she returned to the place from whence she came. Her visit, however, made a deep impression on the minds of many, and the barbed arrow which she left in the hearts of some is not as yet eradicated. Interesting. So, especially some of the elders were taken in by her, uh, this prophetess. Um, and we don't know much about what she was saying or what her prophecies were, but somehow the people in Kirtland were being deceived. This kind of sounds a lot like last week, who, what was the situation? Do you remember? Hiram Page. Hiram Page was receiving prophecies or uh, revelation through his stone. There's no stone that we understand uh, here. Instead, it was a boiling cauldron. There's Hubble bubble to it. No, okay. <laughs> Just kidding. I think it's Shakespeare. Sorry, scratch that. Uh, that was, we, don't know, we don't know that she was using any objects of divine, you know, any instruments, but uh, this is, her, her, her prophecies certainly deceive some. So, that's essentially the context. Wait, real quick. Content, yeah. Please. Yeah, so, going back, uh, so, not yet eradicated. It, not yet, it's, it deceives some, but yet not. Yeah, some are still holding on to her ideas, okay. even after this section was received. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. But it's not, uh, but this not reflecting now, it's just reflecting no, that time. No, reflecting, this is just that, that year, just, this is about, what's the month on this one? Is this February? No. What is this? Yeah, February. February. Okay. This is December of that same year, so it's gotcha. he's saying this many months later, there's still some of her effects are there. Yeah. One. So, good, you. good, good, good. So content of DNC 43, the Lord uh, reminds us of the order. What's the order again? Section 28. Uh, it's the order of the church, meaning the order of revelation, right? Uh, why would he need to repeat it here if it's already been taught in section 28? Well, remember what state was DNC 28 received then? That was back in New York. Where are we now? We're now in Kirtland, a whole new set of saints, a whole new group. Uh, certainly there were s some saints there that uh, uh, may have been involved in the higher page, but not many. Most of them will come uh, in um, May of this year. So this is still February, still early on, so kind of two different audiences. Yeah, yeah? So let's review the order of Revelation again real quick. 2 through 7, here we go. There is one who I have appointed unto you to receive commandments and revelations from my hand. There is none other than him. Uh, none else, verse 4, shall be appointed unto this gift except to be through him. If it's taken from him, he'll have power to appoint someone else, but that's it. Uh, verse 5, this shall be a law unto you that you receive not the teachings of any that shall come before you as revelations or commandments. Right? Uh, don't receive any of those. And verse 6, This I give unto you that you may not be deceived, that you may know they are not of me. Verse 7, There is only one who is appointed again. Now, verse 7 is interesting. Uh, I say unto you, He that is ordained to me shall come in at the gate. That means you're recognized 
by the church. It's usually by this. This is how you come in at the gate. Uh, it's proposed that we sustain so-and-so as the Sunday school teacher or as a whatever. When we go like that, then everyone in the church in your ward or whatever uh, stake or church-wide knows that person has come in at the gate. They're not a wolf jumping over the fence, but they are, have been invited into the gate, right? Uh, anyone who is who comes in at the gate uh, is, or, and is ordained, as I have told you before, they are to teach those revelations which you have received and shall receive through him whom I have appointed. So notice, there's one appointed to receive revelations, but there are many appointed to teach those revelations. Um, and Mrs. Hubble was not this one. Therefore, you can set her down as an imposter. So, that's the, he takes care of the Hubble trouble in the first seven verses. First seven verses. But while I've got your attention anyway, since you've asked, I would like to talk about teaching those revelations. So he kind of segues here in like almost a seamless way from verse 7 to verse 8. Uh, 1 through 7 is about this Hubble. Now verse 8 he switches to speaking of teaching the revelations. Uh, that's what I want you to do when you get together. So now he teaches the doctrine of church meetings. We have a lot of meetings in the church, right? <laughs> lots and lots of meetings. Fourth article of faith. Fourteenth article of faith, sorry. We believe in meetings. We've endured many meetings. We will be able to endure <laughs> all meetings. Right? But what makes a good meeting? What makes a meeting uh, that fulfilled the purpose of meetings? Well, here's the criteria by which we judge. Verses 8 and 9. Can I get a reader for that? Read it for us. 8 and 9. Colin, go. Yeah. <clears throat> and now, behold, I give unto you a commandment, that when ye shall, when ye, with, that when ye are assembled together, ye shall instruct and edify each other that you may know how to act and direct my church, how to act upon the points of my law and commandments which I have given. Uh, and thus ye shall become instructed in the law of my church, and be sanctified by that which, which ye, ye have received, and ye shall bind yourselves to act all in all holiness before me. Boom. There's the doctrine of meetings. Did you catch it? There it is. Boom. First point is to... You are to instruct and edify. That's supposed to lead to you no know, helping those who came into your class or into your meeting or into the conference. Who, when they by the time they leave, they they understand how to act and or direct the church. Right? Maybe here's normal meetings. This is leadership meetings. Right? Uh, and how to act upon the points of my law and commandments. Remember, commandments means what? Revelations. Revelations. Uh, Thus you shall become instructed and sanctified by the law and commandments. You're sanctified by what? By acting on those commandments, revelations, as you're instructed. Which then leads, so uh, you, you are to bind yourself to act in all holiness. Then these go together. You're instructed and sanctified. Probably not. You're not sanctified in the act of binding yourself, but you're, act, you're sanctified. Uh, as you actually act on what you bound yourself to do. Yeah, yeah? You follow on, follow on the flow? Yeah. So, how do you know if it's a good meeting? It does those things. If those things are happening, it's a good meeting. What if you're in charge of the meeting? You better darn well make sure that this is what happens, right? These are these are the, the criteria. Uh, well, yeah, please. Yeah, just say it. Oh, just so that, because there are some reasons why you don't feel edified or uh, instructed could be your problem, so to speak. Yeah. Good, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we got to, um, yeah. you, you can know it's a good meeting if you are, but if you're not, you could still be in a good meeting but missed it. You know? Sure, okay. yeah, if your heart's not right, right, then that could be a problem, yeah. So as you're in charge of uh, meeting together in class situations, as a teacher, right, here's your, here's your, uh, outcomes, right? Uh, well, here's your, I guess, your objective and here's your outcomes that this will happen, right? That your students are instructed and sanctified. But they're going to have to act on it, right? So that's the part where it takes two here. It takes two for sure. Um, so that's uh, eight, nine, ten is related to that. It talks about so that the, as you do all of that, then glory will be added to the kingdom that you've received. And if you don't do that, then it will be taken away. Uh, okay. Now the flow, let's follow the flow of this, this uh, revelation so far. We've got 1 through 7. I don't want you to be deceived by those who pretend to receive revelations for the church. 
I do want you to meet together, actually, and figure out how to act upon the revelations I have given you through the appointed person. I do want that. And then he switches here from verse 10, verse 11. If you kind of stay on the conceptual flow here, or else you get kind of mixed up and lost in this revelation. Uh, 10 through 14. Now, here's what I want you to do. Get rid of iniquity among you. Support Joseph, because he's the one who's appointed. And I will teach you my mysteries through him. So that you can then repeat this. 15 through 25. You are to be taught from on high and sent forth to prepare the nations of earth for my coming. Your voice will precede the voice of natural disasters. So I have someone who's appointed. I want you to get together and figure out how to act upon those revelations that are appointed. If you support Joseph, you'll get more. And I actually need you now to, based on what you now understand, to then go out to the nations and warn them and invite people to obey and bind themselves to the to revelations that Joseph has received. And this is all in preparation for the millennial reign. Back to what uh, Moroni said to Joseph when he was 17, that this is all prepar preparatory to the millennial reign of Christ. So that's the whole flow of section 43. Thoughts, comments, questions in 43. All right. Um, I think it's interesting, one little point in verse 20. Uh, he says, I'm going to start with you through your voice. Lift up your voices and spare not and call upon the nations to repent. So you start, your voice. Then, if and when they reject you, I will send another voice. Whose voices will he send after they reject your voice? Look at verse 21 through 25. What do we got? The voice of... In verse 21, we got the voices of thunders. They're going to they're gonna utter their voices. Verse 22, lightnings will streak from east to west and utter their voices. Verse 23, the Lord will utter His voice. Verse 25, the Lord says, How oft I have called upon you by the mouth of my servants, that's step one, ministering angels, and by my own voice, and the voice of thundering, and lightning, and tempests, and earthquakes, and hailstorms, and famines, and pestilences, and judgment. He calls those the voice of mercy. It's kind of like the hearing test thing, you know. It's like, do you hear this? It's like, yeah. It's like, do you hear this? No. How about this? <laughs> uh, if you can't hear the voice of his servants, then he's going to use a different frequency. Can you hear the voice of lightning, some thunderings, and earthquakes? Uh, he reiterates this in section 88. He'll talk about this again. Instead of saying voice, he calls it the testimony. Earthquakes, thunderings, lightnings, tempests, waves of the sea. Brigham Young said, All we have yet heard in terms of preaching and we have yet experienced is scarcely a preface to the sermon that's going to be preached. When the testimony of the elder ceases to be given and the Lord says to them, Come home, I will now preach my own sermons to the nations of the earth. All you now know can scarcely be called a preface to the sermon that will be preached with fire and sword, tempests, earthquakes, hail, rain, thunders, lightnings, fearful destruction, you will hear of magnificent cities now idolized by the people sinking into the earth and tombing the inhabitants. The sea will heave itself beyond its bounds, engulfing mighty cities. Famine will spread over the nations. The nation will rise up against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and states against states in our own country and in foreign lands, and they will destroy each other, caring not for the blood and lives of their neighbors and their families or for their own lives. So that's intense. That's the idea here. In uh, so you go do your part. You attend your meetings, get instructed really, really well, and then go out and preach that. And hopefully, people will hear your voice. If not, have some backup voices that will be preached. There's some more sermons to come. All right. Any thoughts, comments, questions on 43? It's pretty intense. Yeah. I, I feel like even conference was uh, him calling on it through the prophets through. Yeah, like, I don't know, rushing waves, you know, whatever it is, through those revelatory experiences and everything, of ministering, of, uh, of opportunities. But I love the different uh, parallels or the different symbolisms in here, the ways that he calls us. And I think it's important for us to recognize the different ways he does call us. And so this is great for the youth that you can recognize. How does, what would that look like? Uh, yeah. In that, in your life. Too. Excellent. Yeah. The Lord has more than one tool in His tool belt. How to get our attention, and help us to get His message of repentance, the message of mercy. I like that. That's my favorite in verse 25. As He says, "And by the voice of 
mercy. All right. the day long, all of these are manifestations of mercy. Just different ways of going about it. If you can understand how merciful this is. Yeah. All right, section 45. Section 45. Again, may I just uh, repeat, some of you weren't here, and so let me just repeat what we talked about last week. That uh, As far as the gospel teaching fundamentals of going content and context, then we go to identifying principles, right? And then we go to understanding principles and doctrine. Then we go to feeling the truth and importance of an application. Uh, the focus of this series is to do what? Content and context. Only content and context and a little bit of identifying the uh, some of the principles in these sections. It's kind of uh, impossible to do the content without identifying principles. So we're doing uh, some of that. That's, what, that's how we're able to go kind of quickly. Of course, in class, as you're teaching this, you're going to take these fundamentals all the way to the end. Okay. So very good. So section 45, not a whole lot of context except for these. In Joseph's history, this is only one month after the Hubble trouble. In his history, it says this. At this age of the church, many false reports and lies and foolish stories were published in the newspapers and circulated in every direction to prevent people from investigating the work or embracing the faith. A great earthquake in China, which destroyed from one to 200,000 inhabitants, was burlesqued in some papers as Mormonism in China. But to the joy of the saints who had to struggle against everything that prejudice and wickedness could invent, I received the following. He talking about China. Well, apparently, uh, before this report came that there was an earthquake in China, there was a young Mormon girl who prophesied that there would be an earthquake in China and many would die. And then all of a sudden it happened, and people were like, "Oh shit, Mormonism's true." Uh, but it was burlesque. It was it was caricatured. It was made fun of, right? Uh, uh, and uh, and so, in the midst of persecution there in Ohio, the Lord gave this. Uh, to the joy of the saints, he received section 45. Um, so, let's look at the content of 45. So he gives, uh, so Joseph's been translating the New Testament, or sorry, the Old Testament up to this point. He's been going through um, Genesis, he's made it through basically Genesis 6, and, uh, or is it 7? Yeah, Genesis 7, yeah. And, at this point, the Lord says, okay, that's good, stop. Stop right there. Actually, no, he's made it far beyond seven. He's made it through Genesis. Hold on. This, this comes in later. He has made it through Genesis 14, I believe, by this point. That's right. As soon as he gets through Genesis 14 about Melchizedek, then the Lord says, stop. And in this revelation, he says, I want you now to start the New Testament. So verses 60 through 62, he says, stop the Old Testament, go to the New Testament. So he hasn't made it through the entire Old Testament, only through Genesis 14, approximately. And the Lord says, that's good, jump over now to the New Testament. Showing us again that the Lord is using the JST, and not so much as uh, trying to get primarily a better Bible, but as primarily a springboard so that Joseph will go to the right places and the right revelations, ask the right questions so he can get more doctrine and covenants, more doctrine, more understanding. So... Uh, so that's a big shift. That's historically an important thing from this. So I just wanted to mention that up front. Now let's get into kind of the flow of this, this section. The flow of the section goes like this. Uh, there's an introduction. You all know when, when a speaker is about to speak, if you haven't heard from them before, uh, the person introducing them will list a list of their accomplishments, right? Then we give them some street cred. This person, you know, is the president of some such and such. You get, that, you get all the kind of the... What do you call that in the Greek preaching? There's the ethos, pathos, logos. Which one is this? Why do we? This is this is the the ethos, right? So that we can we we can attach something to the person that's about to speak to us. We take him seriously. Well, here's here's the Lord's own introduction of Himself. Okay, here's His our here's our multi-credentialed God. Okay, He says, "Listen to my voice. I laid the foundations of the earth and made the heavens." All things which live, move, or have their being came about because of me. Mm -hmm. Our next speaker is our advocate with the Father. Uh, is Alpha and Omega, the light and life of the world. He sent the everlasting covenant into the world to be a light and standard to prepare the way for His coming. I am the God of Enoch. That's how. That's, so the first 14 verses are introductory, simply telling us more about Himself, introducing Himself to say what I'm about to say. Please take seriously. Here's my credentials. Now I have a message. 
he takes us up to the Mount of Olives. Here we go, up to the Mount. Up at the Mount, he says, Hearken, and I will reason with you, and I will speak unto you, and prophesy as unto men in days of old. I will show it plainly, as I showed it unto my disciples, as I stood before them in the flesh, and spake unto them, saying, quote, that's when we transfer, trans, uh, yeah, we go back in time. Uh, this is when I said this, quote, As ye have asked me concerning the signs of my coming, in the day when I shall come in my glory, in the clouds of heaven, to fulfill the promises I made unto your Father, etc., starts to go and talk to us about uh, Matthew 24. Um, some of the things he said in Matthew 24, some of the signs of his coming um, that... Uh, that he outlines there. This is going to be the Lord's own commentary on Matthew 24, his own expanded version of that, which uh, Joseph is going to be translating very, very soon. So this is super helpful. Um, in the Joseph Smith Matthew, back in our Pearl of Great Price, you're going to get uh, Joseph, what Joseph learns after this. And so this is kind of preparatory for that. But he, for some reason, the Lord wants to tell Joseph and that early saints who were receiving much persecution at the time, being made fun of, and the little China girl, or the girl that prophesied about the China destruction, how it's being made fun of. In that context, the Lord says, let me tell you about the real signs of my coming, and earthquakes will be a part of this, but there's so much more, right? There's so much more. Uh, in fact, uh, so here we are up on the Mount of Olives now, right? Approximately 26, 60 feet there, uh, right here, uh, up on the Mount, where Jesus was. Now, I want you to notice that uh, the context of what he's saying, okay? Why will he return? It's nice that this has some signs of the second coming, but let's not miss the purpose of his second coming. Uh, I think we do a good job often teaching about the signs, but not super good at teaching about why he's returning. You'll notice in verse 16 at the end, he said, I shall come in my glory in the clouds of heaven to fulfill the promises that I have made unto your fathers. Fulfill the promises that I have made unto your fathers. If he's talking to his disciples on the Mount of Olives about their forefathers, who's he talking about? There's a bunch of Jewish, Jewish apostles on top of the mountain. I'm going to come to fulfill the promises I've made unto your fathers. Who's he talking about? Abraham. As be Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Uh, notice in verse 17. For as you have looked upon the long absence of your spirits from your bodies to be a bondage, I will show unto you how the day of redemption shall come. I like that. This, this is another important point. I'm going to show you how the day of redemption shall come, and also the restoration of scattered Israel. Uh, this is really what the second coming is all about. It's about fulfilling the promises made to the fathers, bringing in the full day of redemption, and the restoration of scattered Israel. This is what the second coming, the millennium, is, is all about. So we know that God made covenant with Abraham, approximately 2000 BC, and part of that was there would be a land of inheritance, a uh, place to gather and worship God freely, but also, ultimately, the eternal aspect of that is that the earth will be inherited in a celestial state, right? So that's the most important thing that section 45 is going to talk about. So back to this. Israel gains the promised land, as we know here, so may covenant fulfilled, right? Covenant's fulfilled. Uh, Jews have received the inheritance, right? Here we are. Oh, then there's Jeroboam, Rehoboam, split. Uh, but they still have it. They still got this stuff. I still have it. But then, whoosh, ten tribes lose the promised land and are scattered in 722 by Assyria. Ah, shoot. And then Judah loses the promised land in 587 with Babylonian uh, destruction. So apparently the covenant promises have not yet been fulfilled. Uh, Cyrus will allow the Jews to return to the promised land about 50 years later. But that's still, they didn't feel like that was the fulfillment of the Abrahamic promises about the land. Jesus comes, is rejected by the Jews and crucified. Jews are then scattered. Definitely, they have not yet inherited the land eternally, right? So DNC 80, uh, 14, 18 through 24 now starts talking about that, about this point in time. He says, you know, to these Jewish men up on the Mount of Olives, <clears throat> you now behold this temple which is in Jerusalem, which you call the house of God, and your enemies say this house will never fall. But verily I say unto you, desolation shall come upon this generation, Jesus' generation, as a thief in the night, and this people shall be destroyed and scattered among all nations. This temple which you see will be thrown down, and one stone not left upon another. It shall come to pass, this generation of Jews shall not pass away, till every desolation which I have told you concerning them shall come to pass. Sheesh. Uh, now, tell me about the history of that. You know about this a little bit. Uh, what happens to fulfill this? They're scattered by who? Yeah, so the Romans come in. The Jews are going to revolt against the Romans. The Romans come in and totally destroy them, scatter them. Uh, and they take... It takes a really long time for Jews to ever come back to this land uh, in any sort of political body again. 
then it inaugurates the time of the Gentiles spoken of in this section here. Uh, verse 22, he says, You say that you know the end of the world cometh. You say you also know that the heavens and the earth will pass away. That's true, actually. For so it is. But these things which I have told you shall not pass away until all shall be fulfilled. This I have told you concerning Jerusalem. And when that day shall come, shall a remnant be scattered among all nations. This is the scattering among all nations. And then verse 25, And they, but they shall be gathered again. But they shall remain until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. When's the time of the Gentiles being fulfilled? That happens during this season here. The covenant is restored through a Gentile named Joseph Smith. This is the season of the fullness of the Gentiles uh, up until the second coming. So according to uh, multiple different scriptures, this one's a good one. Uh, verse 30 tells us, In that generation, what generation? Uh, verse 28, The time when the light shall break forth among them that sit in darkness, and it shall be the fullness of my gospel. When that comes again, when the gospel is being restored again among men, in that generation, verse 30, shall the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. So that is the season wherein uh, the Jews are, so the Jews, the day of the Jews being fully gathered, yet not yet, not yet until after this time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. Uh, so let's, let's continue here. This is our day. Yesterday, the prophet of God stood up and told every youth, age 12 to 18, what? The most important thing you could possibly do in this world is? Yeah. You gather Israel. Both sides of the veil, right? You gather Israel. This is going to be a time of, uh, the time in which we live, a time of significant uh, gathering. That's not the, really the emphasis in this section, but uh, important to point out in light of yesterday's uh, announcements. Uh, as he continues to tell about this day, uh, the disciples are concerned. He talks about uh, true disciples standing in holy places, but verse 33, maybe this is a, you know, maybe the, the, the earthquake in China uh, is on the mind of the saints still, I don't know. But there shall be earthquakes in diverse places and many desolations, and yet men will harden their hearts against me, and they will take up sword one against another and kill each other. Close quote, we're, now we're not in the Mount of Olives anymore. Now we're back in 1831, speaking to Joseph Smith in verse 31. The Lord now says to Joseph, <clears throat> Now when I the Lord had spoken these words unto my disciples, they were troubled. And I said unto them, quote, Now we're back at the Mount of Olives, back 34 AD, uh, or 33 AD, whatever. Be not troubled. When these things shall come to pass, you may know that the promises which have been made unto you shall be fulfilled. Which promises? Which promises? That have been made unto you, the Jews. Well, probably back in verse 16. The promises I've made unto your fathers, the Jewish fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, about what? Promise. About fulfilling the full covenant promises, the day of redemption, the restoration of scattered Israel, all of that coming to pass. So don't be troubled when you see all this stuff happening. That's actually good news. That means it's getting close to the time when God will fulfill the covenant that He's made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob about His posterity and about the restoration of scattered Israel on the day of redemption millennial day. So, let me give you some signs. When the light begins to break forth, right, he says he gives us the parable of the fig tree. Know that summer is nigh. Summer in this instance, in this particular context, is the time of the fulfillment of the covenant promises of God to all the house of Israel. Uh, when you see these signs, don't let it freak you out. Let it give you hope and excitement that, hey, uh, God's promises are about to be fulfilled. And so he gives us some of the leaves, right? Some of the leaves on this, on this tree. Uh, he explains, and we know, let's go through those quickly. Wars, rumors of wars, earth in commotion, men's hearts failing them, love of many waxing cold, iniquity abounding, gospel covenant being restored. That's some good news. Many Gentiles rejected. That's, that, that's bad news. Overflowing scourge. That's a problem. Desolating sicknesses. Not good. Disciples in holy places. Yeah, many earthquakes. Not good. Many desolations. People killing one another, etc. Uh, these are some of the leaves of section 45, but let's not miss the tree for the leaves when we teach this. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. uh, keep it in, keep it in what? Context. In the context of what the Lord is talking about here with the fulfillment. Like this is supposed to give you the greatest oak in the world. Uh, the covenant promise is about to be fulfilled. Other oaks talked about some of these things. People say, well, these earthquakes have been happening forever, so have tsunamis, and so... We just have better instruments of recording, therefore, is it really getting more frequent or not? And Other Oak says, 
Uh, these signs seem to be increasing in frequency and intensity. The book World Almanac of 20, 2004 shows twice as many earthquakes in the, in the 80s and the 90s as in the two preceding decades. Uh, shows a sharp increase in the first several years of this century. And he mentions this idea that uh, increases by comparison 50 years ago can be dismissed as changes in reporting criteria, but the accelerating pattern of natural disasters in the last few decades with similar reporting criteria is ominous. There's even like earthquake uh, tracking websites you can go on to to freak your students out. Fantastic stuff. Really good. Uh, but there's some more signs. He, he goes on to say this. There will be signs and wonders in the sky, verse 40. There will be uh, signs in the earth below, verse 41. Blood, fire, vapor of smoke. And then comes uh, the sun darkened, moon to blood, stars fall from heaven. And then comes the kind of what he was, he's building up to. Here's, here's the build up. Remnant of the Jews will be gathered in Jerusalem, this place, speaking to his disciples on the Mount of Olives. The remnant of the uh, shall be gathered unto this place. And then shall they look for me. The Jews will be looking for me. And behold, I will come, and they shall see me in the clouds, clothed with power and great glory, with all the holy angels. So the Jews will finally receive their Messiah. Right? True or false, Jews believe that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. By and large, they do not, right? There is such a branch of Jews, but um, false. Uh, I wanted to know exactly why, and I wanted to hear it from their mouth, not from, you know, other religions saying why they don't. So I went to their uh, website, main website for Jews, called ayish.com, it's the LDS.org of uh, Judaism. Uh, and there was this interesting uh, thing that said, why Jews don't believe in Jesus? So I clicked on that. And it says, one of the most common questions we receive at Aisha.com is, why don't Jews believe in Jesus? Well, let's understand why, not in order to disparage other religions, but rather to clarify the Jewish position. So here's their, here's their reasons. Number one, Jesus did not fulfill the Messianic prophecies. Mm. What is the Messiah supposed to accomplish? One of the central themes of the Old Testament prophecies is that the promise of a future age of perfection characterized by universal peace and recognition of God. So they go through these. They say these four things have to happen according to the Bible. Uh, the Messiah will build the third temple, gather all Jews back to the land of Israel, usher in an era of world peace, end all hatred, oppression, suffering, and disease, and spread the universal knowledge of God, the God of Israel, which will unite humanity as one. God will be king over all the world. And Jesus of Nazareth did not fulfill those, therefore he cannot be the Messiah. So Jesus, speaking to his disciples here, says, look, they're going to be looking for me for the first coming, right? And it's going to come. It's going to happen. Uh, and this is going to lead to the major conversion of the Jews, which is in part a major fulfillment of the promises made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So check it out. So when we go to verse 47. Then shall the arm of the Lord fall upon nations. Then shall the Lord set his foot upon this mount. Which mount? The mount that they're, they're talking on right here. So the Lord's going to come down. Here we go. He's going to come down, set his foot on the mount, and it will cleave in twain. Right? And the earth shall tremble and reel to and fro. And special effects. Um, the Lord will utter his voice, and the Jews are going to look upon him and say, We knew the Messiah would come. But then they'll say, What? Hey, what are those wounds in your hands? Right? Verse 51. Why are there wounds in your hands and in your feet? Then they'll know that I'm the Lord. Then they will wow. know that I am the one that was wounded in the house of their friend, or in the house of his own friends. Uh, I am he who was lifted up. I am Jesus that was crucified. I am the Son of God. He will say that to them. Then they will weep because of their iniquities, and they'll lament because they persecuted their king. Where are you reading? 53. 53. That was 52 yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I'm like, I love this. Yeah. Sorry. So this, is, this is the major fulfillment. So, Another way, this kind of looks like the uh, S, so, so when we get to our time, then we get to, so we zoom in on this little part here, whoosh, and uh, we see that uh, this times of the Gentiles, the millennial day, when he comes again in verses 43 through 44, the wicked are destroyed, Satan is bound, verse 55 says, uh, we have people in verse 45 coming up out of, their, uh, out of their graves, as well as coming up to meet him in the cloud, we have these different signs. Then we have a description of the millennial condition, um, righteous reigning with Christ, inheriting the earth, in fulfillment of the Abrahamic promises. Verse 58, the earth shall be given unto them 
for an inheritance. Who, just the Jews? Is this just the Jews? No, verse 54, who else? And the uh, heathen nations as well, those who knew no law, as well as, you know, all the covenant uh, Israel, if you look at this whole thing in context. The righteous will then raise children on the millennial day. Everything is beautiful, happy, and wonderful. At the end, verse, uh, in, in 43, uh, 31, in the two sections ago, we saw that men will again deny God right there, and that's, uh, that's kind of how that ended. So, woo, is this eschatological or what? <laughs> Man, this is all about the end of the world. How will God fulfill his promises that he has made unto Israel? When it says in verse 16, I show unto my disciples as I stood before them in the flesh, it's talking about when he was actually living, not after. Yeah, yeah when he was living on the Mount of Olives, that's right. Okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, I was so he's doing a flashback of, like, Matthew 24, basically. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, good. That's what good. Yeah, so that's the context he keeps drawing upon. Good, good. So it's like context within context here, right? Yeah, yeah. so very good. So, now all of that came because why? Saints in Kirtland were being persecuted, made fun of. There was an earthquake in China. Maybe that has something to do with it. That's the context Joseph put in his history. And Mormonism is being burlesque. And the Lord says, you can mock, I guess, but here's what's really going to happen. Uh, the, in fulfillment of all the covenant promises, like earthquakes are a part of that, but there's so much more. Uh, Gentiles and Jews and the heathen will all eventually have a chance to be redeemed in the millennial day. What do you call it? The day of redemption. Yeah, this is this is how the day of redemption shall come. So, uh, thoughts, comments, questions on section forty-five. It's pretty epic, right? Second major eschatological section. What was the first eschatological section we talked about? The other one. Twenty-nine. Answer twenty-nine. Parker, good job. Well done. Also, there's another uh, semi-related piece to this where in the end of this section, uh, the Lord says that the saints are to gather to the western United States in preparation for wars. What wars could that be referring to? That's right. Um, the saints are to purchase their land inheritances excuse me, and build the New Jerusalem as a refuge of safety. They don't know where the New Jerusalem is yet, uh, but they just know that there's, there's some hint here that they're supposed to purchase lands out in the west as a refuge, new, the New Jerusalem will be a refuge, a place of safety, a place of peace, when uh, war uh, is among all nations. Right? That's, the, that's how the section ends. This is how the day of redemption will come. The end.